Let the church say amen. Uh, are you ready to praise the Lord? Oh, the Bible says you ought to praise him in the sanctuary. Amen. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and the organs. Praise him with the cymbals. Praise him with the high sounding cymbals. And it said, let everything, not some things, everything that hath breath. Your highest duty, your highest privilege is to praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And it ain't, it ain't hard to give God some praise. Amen? Let every witness give God some praise this morning. Let every true witness wave your hand, stomp your feet. If you got, as they say, if you got that true religion down inside, you will sow some sign. Can you say amen? It's time to give God some praise to give God the glory, hallelujah, that like you've never given him praise before. You glad to be here this morning? Hallelujah, this hallelujah house where God can get the praise, the glory, and the honor. Amen. We're glad you're here. We're ready to, to let the Holy Ghost loose and let him have whatever he wants to do today. Whatever the Lord wants you to do today, Lord, just have your way in this place. Amen. We want to take a moment to just acknowledge any visitors here today. Just wave your hand. We just want to acknowledge any of you who have been here. This is your first time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God got something, something scheduled for your blessing this morning. Anybody else here today? Just want to acknowledge your presence. Amen. Also, don't want to forget that um, coming oh, today, actually, the, um, the cancer support group is meeting today. Amen. Let's stand beside one another. Amen. Let's give God some presence and some support. Amen. We're entering into worship this morning, not just for ourselves, but for all those that God wants to impact through your life. Get ready because God is about to move in this place. Amen. We're going to ask our minister to come now and lead us into prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Let's not let the hallelujahs fall to the ground. Right? Hallelujah. 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 This is a day the Lord has made. For us to remember, as we're standing here in these beautiful, the beautiful garb, we remember where we came from. But we also know what God has brought us to. And we were encouraged to know this God's not done yet. There's still something else he's trying to do in our lives to encourage us and to pray and to thank him and to know that God has always been there. No matter how difficult it has been in life, God has always been there because it's a plan of life that we had to go through and are going through because it is to our greatest benefit to be able to have these things. And I know this also that God has given us this opportunity this Sunday to be able to recognize our people. What we have done, where we have been. But also, we talked about this this morning, freedom. What freedom feels like, looks like, what it becomes in us. You are free indeed, the Lord said. You are free. Free in him. Free to be able to honor him. And now we get to worship. Worship is a time when we talk to God and we tell him the things that he has done, rehearse before him what he has done, that we might be able to tell him, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done. Let us pray. Lord God, we are before you today, and we have come into your house, Lord God, 
And Lord, we know that in your house, Lord God, there are good things waiting for us, Lord God. There is a word of God that will come forth from the pulpit, Lord God. You prepared the pastor for this, Lord God. You prepared the word to come forth, Lord God. And we thank you that this man of God will give unto us what you have for us, Lord God, to know about you. God, we thank you for all the things that you prepare, Lord God, in your word, Lord God, that anybody can read and know who you are, Lord God. You are self-disclosing, Lord God. You are loving, you are caring, Lord God, and you don't want us to miss one thing about you. And we pray, God, by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, today, Lord God, we will take our time, Lord God, with you, that we will listen to what you have to say, Lord God, that we will do what you've given us to do, but most importantly, to realize, Lord God, that you have come for a purpose for us. Lord, we thank you that our life touches another life, Lord God. Someone in a family, Lord, is being blessed, Lord God, because we are being blessed in you, Lord God. Someone that we work with, Lord God, will come to know who you are, Lord, because of the fact that we know you, Lord God. And God, we pray, Lord God, right now, that anything that we have, it stands between you and us. That God, we, Lord, we turn that over to you. God, we know that, Lord God, we have not been perfect in this week, Lord God. We have said something we did not mean to say. We have done something we should not have done, Lord God. But, Lord, we know, Lord God, as the word says, you are faithful and just to forgive us, Lord God, of our sin. But, God, you love us so deeply, Lord God, that you don't want anything to come between us and you. Lord, thank you, Lord God. Help us, Lord God, to be able to walk, Lord God, and to show to our children that we believe in one, Lord God, greater than us who will give to them, Lord God, an understanding about you, Lord God, that will come when they need it, Lord God, for their lives. God, thank you for your presence right now. And Lord, we pray, Lord God, today we take something away from this day that, Lord, we can use in this week. And Lord, be able to stand for us, Lord God, as we go forth. Lord, you are gracious. You are loving. God, you're merciful, Lord God. You are powerful, Lord God. And God, you know, Lord God, what we need. Help us, Lord God, to hold tightly to it and to walk as those, Lord God, who have your name, your name, Lord God. For we are your sons and your daughters. Let us speak well of you and that it be spoken well of you through us. For these things, we give you, we're careful to give you praise and glory and honor for this day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
Amen. Amen. No, I've been changed. Sign my name. Hallelujah. 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 Welcome into the house of the Lord this special day. You look good. You look good. I was telling Minister Charles, as we were just watching you come in in the beautiful colors, one of the most beautiful things I have ever witnessed in my life was when we were in Africa, you heard my wife tell the story about the people dressed in white coming out of the bush. Another was when we went into this convention and everybody in the place was dressed in, and you know African clothes are colorful. Colorful garbs. It was a beautiful sight. And we're thankful to God for this opportunity to Mimic a little our heritage. You look good. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all you've done, all you're going to do. Magnify yourself in our midst. Magnify yourself in our midst. Help us this day to glorify you in a way we've never glorified you before. And we'll give you praise now and forever. And all the people of God together say amen. Amen, amen again. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. So good to see you. So good to see you. Amen. We take this Sunday to acknowledge, honor, celebrate Black History Month. Black history. History. American history. World history. And in the midst of all of it, we see God at work. We see God at work. And so today, I want to call your attention briefly to a passage, a part of a passage in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 26. The latter part of that passage, Jesus is speaking, and he says, with God, all things are possible. And I want today, whenever we, for the most part, celebrate black history, we have familiar names, people that we highlight and that most of us can recite from memory. But our history is filled with men and women who have left their footprints on the sands of time, have made tremendous contributions to the cause of to civilization and
and they are generally not known. I want to talk to you today about such a person, a man by the name of Lemuel Hayes. With God, all things are possible. I believe if he were here today, he would say that to us. You know, history to many people is a dull subject. They don't find it interesting. Some find it depressing. History is intended to be enlightening, informative, inspirational. It teaches us about God and man. One of the things history shows us is that God chooses imperfect things, imperfect people. God chooses things that man would never choose, people that man would never choose. Lemuel Hayes is such a man. Now, for the most part, you and I would never make the choices that God makes. But that's okay. Because we're not God. It's kind of like in life when one person looks at another and say, I would have never chosen that. I would have never done that. All you're saying, all you are saying is that you are not that person. That's all you're saying. Because if you were that person, you would have made the same choice. Think about it. God. God, the Bible says, chooses the foolish things of this world to confine the wise. If we were God, we would do the same thing. Amen. Amen. This story today speaks to us about our life. It speaks to us about how we approach our life. You know, far too many live their lives in a state of if only. If only. If only I had different parents. If only I'd been born at a different time. If only. And this story, like so many others we find in history, helps us to see that with God, if only's do not have to rule your life. With God. With God. Now, our history hinges on two foundations. 
education and God. It's impossible to study black history without seeing how those who came before us sought to be educated and sought the help of God. We often look at our lives, maybe some of you here today, and you complain about so many things. I look at how we deal with life in general. We place so much emphasis on how a person comes into the world. Go with me. Open your heart to the truth today. We judge people. We evaluate people. We let others evaluate us based on how we came into the world. Everyone would like to have in their past a perfect story about how they came into the world. Everyone would like that. Most don't have that. We play games with one another. We build hindrances that hinder others, we need the lessons of history. This man, his story, which I'm going to share with you some of it today, teaches us three lessons. He teaches more. I want to highlight three lessons that will help us through life Help us to reach what God intends for us to be. Number one, your beginning does not dictate your life. We treat not one another like the way they came into the world. We don't want to talk about it. We try to embellish it as though that has some real significance to life. It's like getting on a bus or a train to go to a place. Does it matter whether you get on the bus at Grand Central Station in New York or at the end of a dusty road in rural America. Your beginning does not dictate your end. This man, let's go back in our minds to the world he was born in before we look at how he came. Born into the 1700s in not what was the United States of America, but the United Colonies of America. 13 original colonies. The United Colonies of America. We did not become the United States of America until 1776. He was born before that. Born in a world, in a country, where slavery had already found entrance into the life of the people. So many say 
that slavery began in 1619 at Jamestown, Virginia, when 20 Africans were sold 1619. Historians, some say, that date is way too late. That it was as far back as hundreds of years before then that slavery made its way into America. This was the world he came into. From Jamestown, Virginia, it spread throughout all of the colonies, became more dominant in some than others because of the agricultural or the way they lived. It is said of New England, the New England colonies, I mention them because this is where he was born. It was said they were not a slave society. They were a society with slaves. They were not as dependent on slavery as the colonies in the South were. Into this world in 1753, in Hartford, Connecticut, Lemuel Hayes was born. Born to a white female servant and a black African American. No, they weren't married. I know how we wrestle with this, how we wrestle, wrestle with this throughout our culture. This young child born into a world where slavery existed with a white mother and a black father. His mother worked for the Hayes family that was relatively way off or well off and they did not, they were those who held their position in society in great esteem. They thought they were somebody. So they were offended when one of their servants was pregnant by a black man. So they fired her. The young lad, historians are not sure what happened to him. They say both his mother and his father abandoned him. If you look at your life, here's a lesson, and you feel like you're doomed, you feel like you can't really be anybody, you can't do anything because of how you came into the world, look at this lad's beginning. Mother and father, name unknown. To this day, no one knows the name of his mother or his father. After the mother was fired by the Hayes family, she found a way to attach the Hayes name to her son out of spite. They fired her because they didn't want to be identified with such a woman. She said, 
I'm going to identify my son with you forever. At the age of five, he was sold into indentured servant. Servitude. Unlike slavery, when you were an indentured servant, a contract was signed and you served X number of years and when those years were passed, you were freed. He was bought by a blind farmer in Massachusetts whose name was David Ross. David Ross was a deacon in a church. I don't know who negotiated this contract of indentured servitude, but it had in the contract that they had to educate the young child and take him to church. Are you hearing me today? Give him an education and introduce him to God. And the deacon and his wife committed themselves to doing this. Somewhere along the line as he grew from the age of five, he received the Christ. They don't know exactly when, but it became obvious that the hand of the Lord was upon him. You know, God lays his hands on imperfect people. And when God lays his hands on imperfect people, he does not make them perfect. And all who know their, know their Bible should have said, Amen. Because do you know that our perfection before the Father today has nothing to do with who we are? It has to do with our connection to Jesus. He is our righteousness. Now again, if you don't know your Bible, you will flinch at that because you will say, well, then he's saying you can live anywhere you want to. That is not what I'm saying. That is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what God requires. But it doesn't change the truth that it is not our righteousness it is the righteousness of Christ that satisfies God. So David Rawls and his wife, her name was Rose, took this young lad and began to educate him and took him to church and he found Christ. They had a custom in their home that every Saturday night they would read a sermon and have a service. The deacon had that custom in his home. And little Lemuel, he was given the name Lemuel by the Ross family. They got that name out of the Bible. Amen. He would read sermons in the service on Saturday night. He'd read the sermons of the great preachers like Jonathan Edwards, like George Whitfield, preachers who were prominent in the first great awakening in America in the 1740s. 
this man, this young lad, became so proficient that he would read these and they would be amazed that he could read so well. And then he began to read sermons they were not familiar with. And they asked him, where did you get that sermon from? He would say, I wrote it. Really? It became obvious that the hand of the Lord was upon this lad. Couldn't God have chosen a different person? But he didn't. So this man, young lad, grew in wisdom, in faith, and at the age of 21, his servitude ended and he was free. Your beginning, his beginning on a farm in Connecticut to a mother and father he did not know, to a mother and father he had no continuing knowledge of, raised by a white family, taught about a God, he had heard nothing about until then only to discover that this God had laid his hands upon his life. Your beginning. How many people today have done great things for God, came into the world in situations that some don't even want to acknowledge existed. Your beginning does not dictate your end. He's now 21. And we look at the second thing his life tells us. He's at an age where he is now trying to find his way. And his life tells us, secondly, trust God and he will help you find your way. Help God. He'll take your life regardless of how messed up it seems. And he'll turn it into something that is a jewel to humanity. So at the age of 21, he's now free. And he joins the militia minute men of Massachusetts and in 1775 when he is 22 he hears they hear in Massachusetts of the battle of Lexington and Concord in the Revolutionary War this militia marches down and this man who was born under the conditions that we've already noted joined in the fight for this country. The history of blacks in America has never fully been told. And so many walk through the earth ashamed 
not wanting to be identified with who they are. Don't you know your history is filled with men and women who not only have done great exploits, but have been vessels of God to change the world. This man becomes ill and he has to leave the militia and he goes back to Massachusetts. And now he must determine what he's going to do with his life. So he starts to study theology. He starts to study about God. Ministers, white ministers in Connecticut, in Massachusetts, help him and he starts to learn theology. He learns Greek. He learns Latin. I've never studied Latin, but I've been told Latin is a hard language to learn. This lad learns it. He studies so much. His mind is so bright, so quick, that he not only lives in the scripture, but he starts to memorize great portions of the word of God. And he wants to be a preacher. In 1780, he is licensed to preach. And the same year, he marries a white school teacher. They have 10 children. A lot of people don't know this, but it was not illegal for blacks and whites to marry in six of the original 13 colonies. It was not illegal. It wasn't illegal in Connecticut. So they married 10 children. He's now preaching. And they are so, people are so impressed by his delivery of the word of God that he is called a black Puritan. The man, God has his hands upon this man's life. In 1785, he's ordained to the congregational church. He is the first African American to be ordained in the whole country. Look where he came from. Look at his beginning. Now with the hand of God upon his life, he becomes the first ordained minister, African-American minister in America. In 1788, he's called to pastor a predominantly white church in Vermont. White. He stays there for 30 years pastoring a predominantly white church. 
He writes against slavery. He preaches against slavery while he's pastoring this white church. After 30 years there, he leaves and he goes back to Connecticut. This man in 1804, Middlebury College, a college in Vermont, where he had pastored a white church, granted him an honorary master's degree. Look at where he came from. Look at where he came from. Being given away by his mother and father and sold at the age of five. Now he's recognized and he is the first African American in the history of this country to be given such an honor. When the hand of the Lord is upon your life, when the hand of the Lord is upon your life, when the hand of the Lord is upon your life, he will direct your way. This man today, generally not highlighted, but history tells us he was one of the most eloquent, enlightened speakers of his time, black or white. He was primarily self-taught. Now I look at so many of us who complain, I don't have no money to go to college. You know, you can find a college on the internet. The world has finally recognized that you can learn through reading. This man read and read we have an abundance of literature books available to us. There's no excuse. None. If we knew our history, we would be more aggressive in pursuing our life's goals. Ain't nobody going to turn us around and ain't nobody going to stop us from being whom God said we can be. With God, all things are possible. When he was 80 years old, Aged, recognizing that the end was near, he went back to his home in Connecticut where he died in 1833. Lemuel Hayes. With God, all things are possible. Your beginning does not dictate your end. With God, all things are possible. 
And thirdly and lastly, your in will glorify God. Your in will glorify God. Remember again his beginning. Don't know his mother. Don't know his father. Sold as a child. Raised by people he didn't know. Look at his end. He composed his own epitaph. And he insisted that it be included on his gravestone, and it was. This is what he wrote. He said, here lies the dust of a poor, hell-deserving sinner who ventured into eternity trusting wholly on the merits of Christ for salvation. This is what he wrote. He said in the full belief of the great doctrines he preached while on earth, he, speaking of himself, invites his children and all who read this to trust their eternal interest in the same foundation with God. With God, all things possible with God. Now, again, remember his beginning. And let me close with this. In 1975, This nation declared his home in Connecticut to be a national historic landmark. Remember where he began. Now I ask you today, look at your life. What doth hinder you? What doth hinder you when this man's life declares to us with God all things are possible. All things possible. I want to close today with us not in the traditional sense of the word. Brother, you were playing before the service began. I want to close with this. Lift every voice and sing. Would you play that again for us? I want to say this to you as we close today. We should sing to God. Sing of his greatness, of his blessings, of his mercy, because we are, we exist, we abide because of him. And I want us today to commit ourselves as we close 
to this. I want you to say this with me. With God, all things are possible. With your help, Lord, I can be, I can do whatever you want me to be, whatever you call me to do. I commit myself to you. Direct my path as you directed the path of my ancestors. Direct my path. Do it for your glory. Hallelujah. Lift every voice and sing. Tell earth and hell. Ring. Oh. Sins. Ah, yes, the glory. Hallelujah. Let us march on till victory. Let's see. Hallelujah. Let those words ring in your spirit. Yeah. Be proud of your heritage. Amen. 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 Thank God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for those who went before us to show us the way. Amen. Amen. Lord, as we leave this place today. Yes, Lord. Yes. We give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor it deserves. We thank you for all you have done. We thank you for inspiring us to trust you. Now in him that is able to keep us and to present us spotless before him, to him be glory, power, and dominion now, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. 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 Consider yourselves dismissed.
God bless you. If someone has left their cell phone in the seat, if someone has left their cell phone in the seat, I have your cell phone. For no. the pictures in the book? She said she was going to send it to you. Uh, this is a friend of mine. He came to join me today at church. What's your name? Carlos. Carlos? Carlos. Carlos, nice to meet you. 